It means that our society has lived in an official reality so incomplete, so inaccurate, that we may with justice call it fictitious. It means that the history we have learned, the science we think we know, and the very core of who we think we are need to be rediscovered. To approach this challenging process of radical rediscovery, armed with sober, intuitive discernment, stay tuned to Looking Out From Within, hosted by Yvonne Palermo and Justin Deschamps, on Full Disclosure Now Radio, and check out their calendar for weekly show schedules at fulldisclosurenow.com. It is time to bat your blue avian eyelashes, roll the magical magdalene beans, gear up for smooth move sala, and vortex roll the quidditch broom potter. We are coming to you live from Mount Shasta. Welcome, flirthers, ballers, and matrix installers. This is Looking Out From Within, hosted by Justin Deschamps and myself, Yvonne Palermo. This special show is the last Thursday of every month, here on Full Disclosure Now. You can find Justin Deschamps News at www.stillnessinthestorm.com. And hey, want to know me? Check out www.groovybean.com. Now, here at Full Disclosure Now, the term full disclosure is the embodiment of an individual's journey in seeking their own truth. It is the understanding that all of us have been lied to that none of us knows the truth and that even the liars are lying to each other. It is an understanding that this world we live in has become a self-perpetuating enigma within itself and it is up to each of us individually to take the journey towards disclosing truth as a community. Since this movement started, we have been approached by individuals both praising the use of the angelic divine numbers along with others cursing the use of Illuminati occult satanic numbers. For us here, the numbers 1111 represent neither. The symbolism of 1111 for us is the representation of a group of individuals unified together. That is it. It is about accepting our individual journeys while choosing to walk together as a community toward a common goal of full disclosure. Hey, please check out our movement and our weekly show calendar at www.fulldisclosurenow.com. Holy social media pants. Do a dance. Stay in the know with FDN. We are on Twitter, Facebook. Give it a like and YouTube. Same goes for me at Groovy Bean and Justin Deschamps at stillnessinthestorm.com. Check out his social media buttons. At this time, I'd like to send a holler out to our friends of goodness in our live chat room and, of course, to all you listeners. If you'd like to join the live chat, there's a bubble at the right-hand side of the... uh, Boop, 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 internet screen. Just click on the bubble and you get in there. But please chat away with respect to all who gather here. Last but not least, we are a donation station. The, sh- the sheep don't sleep here. So if you like what you hear and you want more of it, show the Babylonian love dove doveys. <laughs> Each house has a donate link at www.fulldisclosurenow.com. Click that donate link and follow through. And hey, thank you kindly. Now, tonight's roundtable is coming to you live from the mystical Mount Shasta. There are no kings or queens at this table, but like you, the listener, we are all knights for truth through disclosure. We sit in a universal circle, holding the light in wholeness, honoring our authenticities, and navigating our frequencies together in love. We are joined with... Secret Space Program Insider and Whistleblower, Corey Good. Exopolitical Analysis, Contactee, Writer and Researcher, Dr. Michael Sala. Mystic Visionary and Former Insider, Laura Eisenhower. And Writer, Radio Show Host, Contactee and Conference Coordinator, Robert Potter. Let's journey looking out within together. At this time, I would like to bring on my brother from another spacey mother, Justin Deschamps. How you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for having uh, this beautiful performance here or this beautiful setting that we're at. It's uh, a wonderful time here at uh, beautiful Mont Shasta with all of our lovely guests here. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion that we're going to have with all of you. And um, we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to tell you what the show is going to be like. We're going to have an introductory panel question. 
We're going to ask the guests what they're um, going to be presenting at the beautiful conference. And then we're going to have a dial-in segment where uh, we ask the, each guest a series of questions. And then after that, we're going to go and um, probably have an open discussion and take questions from the audience. So it should be a great show here. Yes, and do you all hear the crickets? Yes. They are singing to us, folks. <laughs> we are sitting outside of Mount Shasta, and it is freaking fantastical. It is. All right, so I want to go ahead and welcome our esteemed guests. So um, I'll go ahead and introduce each of you. First, I'll introduce Dr. Michael Sala. Good to be here. Would you like to say hello? Aloha. Glad right. to be here. Wonderful. And we have Laura Magdalene Eisenhower. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. And Corey Good. Hello, everyone. And finally, last but not least, Rob Potter. Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah, Good to have each welcome. of you. Good to have each of you. So we'll go ahead and get right into it. I'm going to ask um, a panel question where each will have one to two minutes to answer. And the question is, why do you want to participate in the Secret Space Program Conference here at Mount Shasta? And can you give a brief preview of what you plan to present? Let's start with um, Rob. We'll start with you. Well, um, I've always... I've, my son was born here. I've lived here on and off for 20 years. I just love this location. And um, uh, I feel like I'm kind of like a, a talent scout. I know the truth when I, when I hear it and see it. And I, I feel like I've bought in some of the cutting edge people throughout the years here. And again, this year, never before as powerful was with Corey, of course, leading the way as far as disclosure goes, we're getting, it's like, there's all the secret stuff going on. And now we're boom, right in the top seats, the cabals bypassed and humanity is getting a direct uh, view of the insider uh, changes that are going on. And it's about time. So I'm really honored and uh, to uh, bring Michael Sala as well. One of the finest uh, writers on exopolitics, I think very balanced. And I've always, uh, uh, I have to say, adored his work, and of course, the goddess Laura <laughs> Magdalen Eisenhower. I, I, I watch her videos, and I just love her. She's she's just like boom, 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 always there, and I'm really happy uh, to have her. We I tried for a couple of years; her schedules didn't match, so it's really nice. And we have a special program. I personally will be trying to bring to the table. Uh, uh, an orientation towards the divine. And I'm really happy Corey in his last, actually a couple, but last two posts here, we've gotten more context of a spiritual nature wrought here. Greetings in the light of the infinite creator. Uh, he's going to the Venus and the Jupiter portals now, which are the bastions along with the uh, uh, Saturn uh, uh, beings, the super federation 40 and the, what I call the plan of redemption for the earth. So I, I'm going to try to bring a, a spiritual orientation uh, uh, to the message and to support Corey's revelations of the government aspect, but also to realize that this isn't all political. This is about a transformation in consciousness. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Rob. And uh, let's go right to you, Corey. Why did you come here and what are you going to talk about? Well, I'm here because I might have a little bit of relevant experience <laughs> <laughs> on the topic. Yep. <clears throat> My, uh, I'm going to do two presentations. One's going to be over the history of the secret space program and my history in the secret space program. And the other one's going to be about all of the inner earth adventures. Wonderful. Mm. Wonderful. Okay, great. And uh, Laura. Oh, wow. I am just thrilled to be here. I wanted to come to, uh, you know, these events that Robert Potter has put on for quite some time. So I immediately wanted to uh, be here to present about the Secret Space Program. Um, there's obviously a reason I was born into the Eisenhower family, and I've had a deeper soul mission that extends beyond, you know, bloodlines or anything like that. And it dawned on me, you know, really early on that there were a lot of hidden layers to the military industrial complex that I wanted to, you know, understand. And my life path led me to be able to sort of really understand it when I was recruited to go off planet to Mars in 2006. So that whole experience on top of a deeper awareness of my uh, soul mission and just what's happening on the world stage in the political realm and the exopolitical realm 
all those dots that have been connecting have given me, you know, this sense of, I have a lot to talk about and I want to share. And if I don't, I'll pop. And, um, and it's amazing to be amongst these folks because I've been able to ground and, uh, make sense out of so much because of what they bring to the table. And I think this is what it's about is that we inspire others to come forward, to share their stories. And, uh, and I love to be an example for that while I also have my own story that I love to share. So certainly. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Dr. Sala. I first came here in uh, 1999 and uh, one of the most profound experiences I had was to see this enormous two kilometer, one kilometer wide flying saucer sitting over the top of Mount Shasta. It just was this enormous lenticular cloud and, and I knew that there was something more to it than just being a cloud, that there, there was some extraterrestrial energy associated with that, a flying saucer or whatever it was. But I always have felt that Mount Shasta is a very special place and a place for contact. And over the years, I've just become more convinced that this is a place where uh, eventually there will be um, contacts happening on a much more regular basis between uh, humanity and the different extraterrestrial civilizations. I'll be giving two presentations at this conference. Um, I'll be discussing uh, the extraterrestrial alliances that have uh, historically been very politically significant for our world. So I'll be looking at how these have shifted over the last century and what countries have been most involved with which extraterrestrial groups. I'll also be looking at the uh, current negotiations that are happening right now, the negotiations involving different uh, nations, different alliances, uh, different national blocs and political leaders, you know, who, who are the ones that are most significant for helping the truth to come out about secret space programs and extraterrestrial uh, life. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a fun and exciting weekend for sure. Absolutely. And uh, it is amazing to be able to meet all of you in person and have the opportunity to, to work together in the flesh. So I, I do appreciate that for sure. Um, okay, great. Well, that was wonderful. So now what we're going to go ahead and do is get right into the individual questions. So we're going to start with you, Corey, first. Um, here we go. Thank you, and thank you all for your answers, and I'm honored to be here, and thank you very much. Corey Good. Hello. How Hello. are you? Corey, are the blue avians the ancient builder race, or are they the next evolution? They have not told me that they are the ancient builder race Okay. directly. <clears throat> that is sort of something that uh, David and I have kind of assumed, yeah. but... Uh, if I've assumed wrong, they haven't set me straight. So, okay. um, to be honest, we don't quite know yet. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And um, now in your recent post, there was a, a projection for how many people were going to ascend. And I know I personally got a few very impassioned emails with people worrying, you know, what does this mean exactly? Yeah. So I wanted to give an opportunity to maybe add some clarity about what that figure might have meant, which was uh, 0.042% is the current estimate. So is that, is this a prediction or is this something that um, is currently at and pending some future events? Yes, it uh, it's about 300,000 people. Okay. And it was stated that if the event were to happen at that moment, mm -hmm. that's how many people w would ascend. Okay. And it was sort of put forth as a cosmic wake-up call. Sure. Because mm -hmm. you know how everyone always thinks that information applies to other people, but not themselves. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and many of us are we're really rolled up into our little UFO religions and our belief systems. Mm -hmm. And we think, you know, that's all there is. And that's, you know, I'm, I've made it. Right. But, uh, you know, I, you know, they let me know in no uncertain terms that I was not in that number yet that I have, really? I, see. Yeah, okay. that I have, I have room to go too. So it definitely was a wake up call for me to try to make some more positive changes in myself and try to be more service to others. Interesting. Okay. okay. I'm glad you mentioned it because that when I was reading the post, that's the interpretation I got was that it's a, a current estimate. It's kind of the analogy I've been using is you put in a turkey into the oven and you got the thermometer thing in there 
and it takes four hours to cook and you check it after 30 minutes and the internal temperature is barely moved and you're like oh my god this thing isn't right. going to cook <laughs> yeah you know well we're not done yet you know right. we still we still got to do the work we still got to make a lot the of the stuff. inner earth people uh, right now we're opening the yeah. oven a little too early and looking in you know exactly so yeah so mm -hmm. for anybody who was really concerned about this take it as an indication that you know to motivate yourself to do work but don't also mm -hmm. take it as a be all end all yeah don't situation. be don't feel defeated Right, it should right. motivate you, Very not make important. you feel defeated. Right. Excellent. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, Corey. During a recent Inner Earth update, you stated that the Anshar were going to start reaching out to the surface population. What would you suggest we can do to facilitate or develop that contact? Well, one of the things that they've stated that they want to do is to reach out to us <clears throat> and walk among us again. But uh, there is a, an ancient treaty that's in place that prevents any groups from doing that. And they refer to it as the Mohammed Accords. Okay. And it has nothing to do with Mohammed other than it occurred close to the same time he walked on the earth. Right. So <clears throat> in order for them to walk freely amongst us, all the signatories of that accord have to meet and, and make an agreement. Okay. So um, I, I would... Uh, and, and, and most of the, the information that have come from the Anshar and the Blue Avians mm -hmm. is tell the people to stop reaching out for us. Tell the people to stop praying to us. Tell the people to look within, yes. shine the spotlight within, and grow. Mm -hmm. Don't look outside. Get off of your knees. Mm -hmm. Right. You have the power. You can. Absolutely. And then how would, how would an individual know that they were actually contacting someone from the Anshar group? It's hard to say because there's right. so many trickster beings out there. Yes. So what do, what does one do? Well, I do what I do is when I'm contacted and I do not see a being, mm -hmm. I tell them I want to see them. Mm -hmm. I want to experience their energy. So I I have uh, pretty much demanded face to face okay. encounters, and I have received them. I know that not everyone is going to receive them, but mm -hmm. You know, it's really hard to know. Most of the beings out there are tricksters. Right. Yeah. So it's really hard to know if you are in contact with a malevolent or benevolent being. Because the uh, benevolent ones can appear as angels of light. Absolutely. Sure. So you're essentially getting like a, ca a physical calibration for their energy that then you can use to identify them. Right. The main thing. later, I guess. Yes. The main okay. thing is use your discernment and also... Don't focus outwardly on other beings. You need to focus inwardly. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the bigger message, I think, mm -hmm. is... That'll is... get you into that group of 300,000 or make <laughs> the group right. grow. Yeah. We yeah. want exactly. it to grow. We need right. it to go, woo! Yeah, we yes. want it to be 7 billion. Yes. Exactly. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. All right. Well, let's... Um, you actually answered our yeah. next question already, <laughs> so that was beautiful. So uh, thank you for that. We're going to go ahead and move on to our next panel guest, which is Laura. Okay. And you want to... Sure. Laura. Lovely Laura. Hello. <laughs> yes. You said in the past, we are free energy technology. We are the vehicle. If we are that vehicle, how do we maximize our potential? Well, to be very conscious, you know, from the minute you wake up to the, just all throughout the day till you fall asleep at night, just be conscious of what you're energizing, what you're communicating to others what the quality of your relationship with yourself is and those around you. Um, and, and what are you in agreement to, you know, what have you, um, allowed yourself to sort of compromise? Where do you give your power away? Uh, I mean, this is something that we can sort of assess and figure out within a week and, and shift maybe the next week. And then in no time at all, we can be very sovereign because we're, I'm, I'm here to really protect the divine template that we're all born with. and the DNA potential. Uh, when we look at our ancient history or just some of these mythologies, you know, the tree of knowledge is connected to our DNA. Mm -hmm. And we are sort of in agreement to being in this duality, uh, but it's been targeted with mind control. And so knowledge is something that doesn't come so easy, but knowledge is really gnosis, which is self-awareness. And so my focus has always been the inner work. And that's why I really love what he shared, because uh, that's the only vehicle that I can think of, you know, to get myself there. And mm. I, I'm not really good. I mean, I, I thank my so-called ADD. <laughs> it served me because it's like, <laughs> yeah. but there's a lot of focused intent on, you know, what's going on in here. And right. 
lots of questions and, uh, you know, really paying attention to what my physical body is telling me. Because when we look at kinesiology and muscle testing, Mm -hmm. you know, the same thing applies when something presents itself to us. I mean, Mm -hmm. how does it feel? Does it feel right? Are we allowing ourselves to be uh, yanked into, you know, a program that begins to desensitize us Mm -hmm. and and, and put us in sort of this uh, false sense of security or false light? And the thing is, so many well-intentioned people get caught up in that. And so um, I think we have to just be willing to look at the heart and soul of each individual and not see the programming so we don't create that division of, oh, they're sheeple. I mean, if we're going to be the example, mm-hmm. we have to be willing to reach the depths of others and, and you know, have compassion for how it's easy to get caught up in those traps. And amongst us who are in the so-called truth movement or whatever you want to call it, uh, we, we can't be in these information wars. We have to have the highest mm-hmm. integrity and really look at ourselves and recognize that in this position, we have great responsibility. And, and I've learned a lot from my great grandfather uh, on, on that level. Um, and just, you know, delving into his quotes and he's been a spirit guide, you know, throughout my life. And, um, and that's one thing that I've really felt from him. And then also the timeline manipulation, the, you know, the, the, the propaganda that comes out to sort of turn history around. And they've done that with mythology. They've done that with the feminine. They've done that with the whole idea of even relationship, you know? And so when we go into these higher DNA levels, we're actually going into higher organic union. We're actually healing the earth grids because they were unplugged, you know, certain areas where the uh, cathar lines and the Albion body used to be connected where sacred union uh, was, was a part of the land and a part of Gaia. When that got unplugged and our DNA experienced that and the mind control came in, Mm -hmm. the thing is, we might be intimidated by this negative ET agenda or the alien machinery, but when we push the envelope and allow ourselves to really answer to that deeper soul longing without seeing it as a distraction or something silly, and we can start to recognize the rest as the distraction, right. we can begin to become really uh, connected to unity consciousness and, and understand the priority of love and family and um, being guardians and stewards to this earth. And then the parasite gets starved. So, I mean, just really look at the most important thing. I mean, just looking at a bird or anything in wildlife and just how cute the little chipmunks and squirrels is just like, that is so much more exciting than seeing Hillary Clinton's face, you know? So like yes. turn it off oh and turn it on. Right. Absolutely. That's what I have to say. Yeah. Right on. Oh, woo, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. The clone is breaking down. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in the past you've mentioned goddess energy. And I wanted to ask, what was your, what is that energy? Can you define what that is and how that's playing a part in what's happening right now? Well, it's an energy that exists within every being. And it is uh, a very unique planetary body uh, because of us sinking into this lower density. When we look at harmonic universes and we look at the soul architecture and um, where we used to be when our DNA was fully activated and we were able to come and go from the physical more by choice. Well, being in a free will universe uh, created this differentiation and this sort of warring race to come in to take advantage of uh, the negative ego sort of service to self mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a part of learning and growing. You know, there's there's a lot about just development um, and and how we're here to sort of fall on our face and get back up again to you know recognize the right use of power, which is why this scenario of the twelve tribes being seated and you know, the root race is coming about so that we could share these codes. Um, This one race or, you know, different factions that have sort of joined in have decided, well, they want to, you know, be in control because they see us as vulnerable, but they're threatened by the fact that we have the capacity to reach levels that are beyond where they are. Not because Mm -hmm. they can't get them there themselves. It's because they wanted to play a role um, in a sort of competition or rebellion to, um, this greater, you know, connection that represents the unified field and, uh, the connection with, um, the seven higher, you know, heavens. And I mean, that's why Andromeda and Milky Way separated. And so that's an example of our own negative ego when it wants to sabotage our higher self or our inner divine feminine. So this planetary body, which is considered mother earth, which some may call Gaia Sophia, which I kind of focus in on. And it's always been an awareness of mine as a kid. Um, you know, understanding the earth grids and what's organic and knowing also that this invasion has compromised the stargates and the earth grids and uh, the cataclysms that threw the planetary body off whack. It's sort of like being in a car accident and then having a doctor 
you know, give you meds for the rest of your life and then, or, or sort of being on an artificial life support system without going through the holistic process of healing. Certainly. The goddess energy mm -hmm. represents the nurturing, unconditional love that's holding space for us to see where we're going wrong without us needing to save her. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see the chemtrails and we're like, oh my gosh, you know, guy is being attacked, but she's multidimensional. So we have to understand that this is part mm -hmm. of a blessing to us to be able to say, wait a second, I can change the nature of who I am and how I operate by connecting with that and being a part of that immune system instead of being a part of uh, that negative ego construct that likes to shut it all down and lean towards uh, things like artificial intelligence and transhumanism, mm -hmm. which is a false version, an imitation of the true creation. So, <laughs> so the goddess energy to me is that unconditional nurturing love that man and woman hold. It's not about a feminine figure. It's not about women taking over. Okay. I mean... It's really about sacred union and about going through those initiations, but, but also remembering that she's been very targeted. And so we need to appreciate the mother so that we can uh, empower the divine masculine and the Christ consciousness to emerge within ourselves so that we can be the harmony of both instead of the power struggle, which we see in the world with patriarchy and the exile of Certainly. the feminine in our culture. Right. Wonderful. Mark, graciously. Thank you. I'm glad I came out well. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely magically beautiful. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you. Okay, and I'm up. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to, to no, jump? Okay, okay, okay. So, Laura. Okay. Is your DNA different from the average bear? I feel like a total train wreck. So nor <laughs> from my human perspective, like I'm just like, you know, please <laughs> help me. Um I have readers and people coming out of the woodwork saying all sorts of weird things about my DNA. And I don't really, you know, care to share that publicly to be, but if I feel super attacked, it's like, you know, I, I kind of remind myself, it's like, okay, well you can reach from this certain place that, you know, there is a bit of a difference there. And it's not that it's something that other people don't have. It's a responsibility of being an activator because, you know, eventually we're all going to join in and become one with right. this unified field. And so I know that there was something, there's something particular to my DNA and I think a lot of people must carry it. I mean, who, who even checks? I mean, I didn't go out of my way. I didn't go out of my way to have any sort of validation about anything. Mm -hmm. It sort of found me because I drifted off and I okay. was getting really ungrounded and certain people would get this and they still do to this day, like even last right. week, like, like red alert, red alert, we got to go pull <laughs> her back and ground mm -hmm. her in maybe this truth about herself that I at times am not willing to fully own. Because okay. sometimes I don't feel worthy of me <laughs> or like whatever. Because sure, yeah. the thing is I'm a vessel and, I, and I'm preparing my vessel for something greater than myself to come in. And sometimes I'm just like, man, I really screwed up. And why the hell would you want to come through me? And, and that's very unconscious. Mm -hmm. But there is a DNA thing that is different than maybe those that are on the incarnation wheel or the, the wheel of necessity that allows me the revelations or the ability to get myself to that level mm -hmm. but my god do i almost fall off a cliff so many times that you know and then it's like the mission is greater than anything it's kind of like you know when your love for your kids is greater than yourself and so the thing that pulls me back is not me or my ego mm -hmm. it's the greater mission of my love for humanity and knowing the potential of humanity because without that i'm pretty darn self-destructive and there's so much attack and so many things that are right you know trying to do the opposite that i do need that assistance to remind me and so yes there is some stuff there and I don't need to go into it. I mean, it's, there's okay. just extra strands that cannot be touched that I can always draw upon and that I'm okay. helping to bring to the table in order to invite others to match it instead of have it be something that is like the old paradigm structure of, I got something that you don't because okay. right. that's right. not how it works. Okay. And I've never okay. ever felt that way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think I've taken on, you know, a path that has beaten me down because right. um, I've, I've, I've made sure that I would never fall into that trap. And even Eisenhower, who was president, you know, I, I saw that sort of humility in him too. And mm -hmm. when I see my family, it's like, you know, we're driving beat up Honda, you know, we're <laughs> gathering a family. People probably think we're showing up in limos and it's some Illuminati family. We're just <laughs> singing karaoke. And because right. my uncle David, you know, David Eisenhower brings the karaoke machine and, and we're all loving each other, but we know to not bring up too much of the craziness yeah. because we know that love is the priority and we're not all going to see mm -hmm. it the same way. And so I'm, I always thought, you know, there's no way nobody's ever, anybody in this family is going to talk to me again. I'm probably totally ostracized. And mm. the more I do and the more I allow what I do to help me to thrive, 
the more they see me and the more gratitude they have and the more loved I feel, mm. you know, and, and if you don't get that from your family, it doesn't matter. The point is you plant seeds and you find your yes. soul family, but right. those that are ready will, will step up to the plate and recognize you. And, and so yeah. don't let it bring you down. I used to let it bring me down and then they'd see me and say, yeah, you're screwed up. But when I allowed who I am to help me to thrive, then they're like, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> there must be something there. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you Beautiful. so much. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to go right to Dr. Michael Sala mm -hmm. and I'll go ahead and jump in on okay. this one. Um, what is your approach to vetting whistleblowers and their authenticity as you've become a pretty big figure in this regard? Well, you, when you've been doing this for a few years, I've been, I've actually been working in the field, uh, since 1989, where I've been doing field work, uh, basically going to different countries to view, uh, and to examine claims of human rights abuses. So I used to interview people who had been abused by the, by the national militaries or the governments. And so I began doing that in, in the 90, early 1990s. And after a while, you just get to have a feel for, you know, who's telling you the truth and, you know, what, what sort of things to look for when people have these stories uh, about whatever it is that they've experienced. Now, in 2001, uh, my focus shifted from human rights abuses to uh, whistleblower claims of involvement in government uh, conspiracy theories, uh, covering up uh, proof of extraterrestrial life. And so, you know, it was a kind of similar problem in the sense that uh, there were these people that typically didn't have documents to substantiate what they had experienced because in the case of uh, human rights uh, 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 people who've been abused, uh, governments take all the all the um, hard evidence. So you don't have that. You have to go with the kind of soft evidence, the the, the testimony, the sincerity, uh, other, what other witnesses have said. Um, and so the, a similar sort of thing with uh, whistleblowers. You try and uh, assess how sincere are they, uh, you know, what do they stand to benefit from this, uh, which is why I was very impressed with, uh, in 2001, the uh, Disclosure Project press conference by Stephen Greer, because these were professionals, and I knew that they would not gain professionally in any way mm -hmm. from talking about what they say they saw, that in, in fact it would be the very opposite, that they would lose a lot of credibility, a lot of standing in their communities. Um, in their professions, but the fact that they came forward and said that this, these are the things that they saw or experienced, that gave me a lot of confidence that these were things that were really happening. So, you know, because the, they, they stood a lot to lose, not so much to gain from coming forward. Uh, you, you do the cross-referencing, you know, but ultimately it's, um, you know, kind of like what uh, Corey was saying when it when it comes to um, you know people with all sorts of claims, you, you have to rely on your discernment. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, you have to try and discern who's being uh, honest. Uh, you know what agenda is there, and it really means being true to yourself or you know, finding out who who you are as a person. And and I, I think many people that are involved in this field have done a bit of work in that regard. So I think a, a lot of people doing this work have de developed enough discernment to kind of get us a feel for when people are telling the truth or not. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> All right. Dr. Sala, do, do you have ET contact experience? Uh, not directly. Uh, uh, there have been a number of things that have happened through my life that have made me suspect that I've got some connection. Uh, typically, the kind of dream uh, dream life, uh, you know, that there's been a lot of dreams involving that. There've been some anomalous experiences, like uh, you know, hiking up Mauna Kea and, and having this kind of whirling spiral, like a mini tornado, come up to me and mm -hmm. um, and kind of like you know, you know, check me out, and, and I'm kind of thinking, well, what is that? Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that was very suspicious, and so there have been things like that. Um, that have occurred, of course, I uh, mentioned earlier the, the experience with the kind of uh, lenticular cloud over Mount Shasta, and I've seen the lights in the sky, but, but nothing that I would kind of like say that, you know, that would, you know, for me be uh, an example of uh, contact and where I could say that I'm a contactee. So really at this stage, I'm, I'm still kind of investigating contactee claims, and, and certainly, yeah, I, I would love to... Um, meet with extraterrestrials, and I think uh, you know, that day will come. 
Um, and I think that a lot of the work I've been doing will mm. prepare me for that. Mm. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, what do you feel your role is or what you can contribute to the full disclosure movement, so to speak? Well, I think uh, I can do a few things. Uh, my background was in academia. So in academia, what you try to do is kind of cl clarify exactly the phenomenon that you're studying, uh, put it in a clear conceptual framework so that others can come along and look at what you've done and build on that. And, and that as an academic is kind of second nature, that you collaborate with others and, and that others come along and they look at what you've done and they can agree or disagree, but it always is a kind of collaborative process. Uh, one of the things that I also did uh, during my career was uh, to, to work as a citizen diplomat and I, I actually did get to work at an official level uh, with uh, the US State Department, with the Australian Foreign Affairs, uh, the, the United Nations and uh, other, other countries uh, at a kind of diplomatic level doing the citizen diplomacy initiatives I was involved in as an academic. And I feel as though that is something I can kind of lend uh, to those that are looking at what does extraterrestrial contact mean? Because I think what really is happening with contact is that you know, you're actually having uh, people being contacted and these people who have been contacted in a sense become like uh, emissaries or representatives or delegates for different right. extraterrestrial groups. And so it's very important to recognize that they are part of a kind of outreach by off-world civilizations that want to interact with us mm -hmm. and that people can go through certain skill trainings to be able to develop these ambassadorial or diplomatic skills. And that's something that I am very interested in and uh, would be very happy in the future to actually help train people to have diplomatic um, contact with different mm -hmm. extraterrestrial visitors. Yeah. And this is something that you've been holding courses with, I believe, uh, actually. Oh, yes, yes. I've, I've held courses um, on... Uh, galactic diplomacy and mm -hmm. you know while I was teaching at American University in the uh, School of um, uh, International Service I was actually teaching courses on uh, international diplomacy and citizen diplomacy so I feel as though this is just a kind of natural outgrowth of what I was doing professionally but now I'm doing it in a in something which is outside of academia but I know eventually the day will come where it'll all merge that kind of academic Certainly. world will, will merge with this kind of unfolding uh, world of uh, galactic diplomacy and extraterrestrial mm -hmm. contact. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Rob Potter. You want me to? Go ahead. All right. Rob Potter, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I am enjoying the scenery. <laughs> is this not fantastic this with is, all the crickets? We call this Sweet and Baby Sage Mount Shasta. Ooh. <laughs> Very special energy going on here. Oh, it's amazing. And it's very nice here. Yes, thank you. Okay, question for you. Even though you and Cobra have parted ways, are you still collaborating with him? And if so, how? Um, I have uh, parted ways in a sense with him. I, uh, Cobra is a wonderful guy. I really appreciate his uh, intelligence. He has a very unique scientific background. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came to Cobra, it actually went back to my original contactee with uh, Gabriel Green, which was separate from Fred Bell. Um, he told me that uh, the Ascended Master Hilarion had sent a teacher, and there was a military guy. Uh, when I arrived there, there was a V in the snow. It was like 23 or something. And um, I've been having a lot of contacts, but they were out of body. And like Corey said, a lot of these communications very difficult to process. Mm -hmm. So I had to have a separate contact from Fred Bell. And the guy said, well, I said, what's the V for? He goes, they put that there for you so you know. And that's the victory of the light. Mm -hmm. And Cobra bought that up. And then there mm -hmm. were some other uh, synchronicities. And I started writing on his blog. And uh, kind of, I, I was praying very, very hard to creator to use me or take me off this planet. I've been having these out of body and these vision spiritual experiences my whole life and um the parts clouds parted in uh wales my favorite little meditation spot and um i ended up doing some confer uh, conferences for cobra and uh, we went to egypt and uh became uh 
very close friends. Um, we worked in uh, Thailand a little bit together, and uh, I did another conference in Laguna, and uh, we tried to, uh, we talked about kind of doing what Hope Girl wanted to do, which was kind of unify people and he asked me to step into the prepare for change group it's hard when there's a large group of people with different things and mm -hmm. uh, and i wrote the kind of thesis for that and uh which is the beginning of his book called the event that was kind of a series of laying a groundwork for this is what's going on mm -hmm. uh, the criminals need to be arrested and it made sense to me the arrest process on an earthly level is a logical conclusion for me, and um, I think it uh, has validity. Now, we can't get our families to come together for dinner at the same time. How are we going <laughs> to mm -hmm. get all these guys arrested at once? Certainly. It's yeah. very difficult. So the model and idea is, is, is good, but the Super Federation 40 and the various groups that are working have entire... Ooh. changes in process. I mean, mm -hmm. years ago, it was like, you know, Hatan was saying, uh-oh, uh we better, uh, you, you better, there could be nuclear war. You know, they constantly are modifying the situation. And here comes the big mother Mount Shasta train yeah. that runs through the town. <laughs> yeah, if anybody can hear that sound, that's the train right there. <laughs> anyway, so, um, anyway, I love Cobra. I, um, he, he wants to remain secret. Uh, you know, there's, I do have a, I, I kind of feel like at this point, what's the point? Right. He, he's had so many conferences. That's his personal um, sure. viewpoint. Um, I always support it. I've never told anyone who he is. I have friend people say, who's Cobra? Is he this guy? And they say, I promise I'll never tell. Mm -hmm. And I never will until he decides to come out. Mm -hmm. Sure. But um, he's very kind of scientific. He's, mm -hmm. He reminds me of Fred Bell in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm kind of uh, dispassionate, but he has a very good understanding of the Scather Field Network, and he's working with a group from not Planet X, but another planet that orbits our, our solar system here every 850 years. Mm -hmm. And this group recently was liberated, maybe like Micah and uh, mm -hmm. the Blue Spheres. It seems mm -hmm. like there's a cleansing process going on. And um, that group has a certain intel, and, and he has a very... Uh, certain thing uh, about certain things and he's been wrong about things and um, he's been right about things. I have mm -hmm. a completely different viewpoint of Christ and the universal Christ and who uh, uh, Hosha was in that thing but I was actually advised by the uh, a Venusian uh, that I've been contacted by to step back from the political aspect of disclosure a little bit mm. to focus more on the healing and the presence mm -hmm. everything's going to happen the planet is going to go through a process of ascension there is vibrational changes taking place in the atomic structure of nature itself mm. that will naturally change things there's a recalibration going on in nature and we need to remain calm keep our arms and hands inside the spaceship and remember to pray right you know eat less pray more mm -hmm. and do unto others mm -hmm. and love thy neighbors as self that's pretty simple and if we look to the infinite creator we're all sons and daughters yeah so if we treat each other as brothers and mm -hmm. sisters we're going to get there so all this stuff and, and and the the political things going on it's very exciting to know but just remain calm. The uh, first contact is is designed with the precision of a Swiss watch. Mm -hmm. And everything will take place. There will be earth changes. And it will be controlled. So right. um, that's kind of Thank you. where I'm, I'm mm -hmm. working with. Mm -hmm. I, I still love Cobra. Okay. Um, and um, I'm just stepping back from that because it was... We were, it was a little too, it was probably good for us to just kind of mm, have a certainly. separate thing there. Yeah. Certainly. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I know on your website, you feature a lot of technology, and uh, technology is mm -hmm. obviously something that full disclosure is going to be a prominent feature. So I wanted to ask mm -hmm. what, how, you do, how do you envision technology playing a part in full disclosure? Well, obviously, 
uh, when the the 30 different types of hyperdrives that the ETs in the secret space program are using are given, that, that's going to transform the planet. There's talk mm -hmm. about it. We're, we're getting ideas of it. And, and when it finally busts loose, that will change. The technology like that we have with the Pleiadians was called divine intervention. Mm -hmm. And this is utilizing sound, light, and color, and sacred geometry mm -hmm. to establish uh, a harmonic uh, for the auric field, and I'll be demonstrating that uh, at, at the show tomorrow night. I have a, a pretty good laser crystal show, and we'll be sharing the pyramids and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of like the Corey healing technology light. It's, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when the vibrations come up, if the ETs want, like when I was in Fred Bell's house, the ships actually would settle into the house. And I, I would just know that they were, <laughs> the house, we'd have these vortexes. Uh, of energy, and uh, there'd be a tremendous uh, expansion of consciousness. And I remember his little daughter, when she was very young, was there. So this type of technology is recognized by the uh, ET, some of these sacred geometry stuff. And for those people who are into crystals, um, Semyasi said that the quartz crystal is a perfect synthesis of spirit and matter in zero time. Mm. And it actually is a very affordable tool that amplifies your thought forms. Yes. And there's actually a consciousness, a living being that's been filmed that goes from a person to the crystal and, and can be used this way. So we're just beginning to break mm -hmm. through into this new technology. And, of course, this will come with uh, when the veil is dropped, um, it'll it's going to be an interesting time for, for this technology mm -hmm. and other technologies or scalar waves and it can all be used for good. It doesn't have to oppress us and, and so, jack us up and yeah. control us. Right. It's just a tool. Yeah. Just a tool. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to, I'm going to ask you one more question and then we are going to take a five minute break. And I do want to tell everybody tuning in. What? Yeah. We're coming to you live from Mount Shasta. I'm your host, Yvonne Palermo. I'm here with my spacey brother, Justin Deschamps. This is www.fulldisclosurenow.com. And hey, Rob Potter. Yeah. Is there any significance to the Mount Shasta location for the SSP conference? Well, like I said, my son was born here. I resonated. I was from Laguna Beach. I was always a beach boy. Spent my time at my youth in Hawaii with my father in Kahala and beach, beach, beach. And I came up here in a rainbow gathering in 78, really connected. And I came up here in, I think it was 94. And I just like smelling the, the mm. sweet pine. I just said, I'm a mountain man yes. too. So mm -hmm. that's the significance. And of course, uh, I've lived on the mountain there. Uh, there is violet flame pouring out of this mountain. I mean, you can walk along in the snow, mm -hmm. crunch, crunch, crunch. There's some mis magical, mystical energy there. Um, of course, we have the teachings of St. Germain, which took place in Panther Meadows. We also have Erlaine Cheney, a woman I met in the 70s from Astara, who had her meetings with the masters on Mount Sasta and went into the inner retreats like Louis did in, in Lampu in South America. By the way, South America and Mount Shasta are very closely connected in the Agarthan network. Mm. Uh, oh. And there is a uh, externalization of the inner earth Agartha network. And we will be having contact with them. Um, and we, many of us will go inside eventually at some point, they said, when the when earth changes take place. So it's a gradual process. Mm. And I think Mount Shasta is one of the major galactic ports. I've seen mm -hmm. many of these famous pictures of lived here for many years. And uh, it's obviously there's like, oh, there's a conclave going on tonight. There's a giant cloud mothership that just swirls on the mountain for four days straight. And you know that something's going on. So mm -hmm. it's exciting to be here. It's si yes. ex exciting. I want to thank again uh, my guests. I'd like to thank you, Roger. Uh, you know, uh, we got KP uh, mm -hmm. hiding in the background here. Mm -hmm. We got yeah. a lot of people. It's a wonderful energy, and I, I think it's going to be a, a great weekend, and, and it's an honor to to have everyone here today. Mm, well, Certainly. we want to thank you. Thank We're going to go to break, and hey, Emma Gold, Roger, is going to talk. Woohoo! <laughs> Hey, hey, welcome back to Triple W, Full Disclosure Now. This is Yvonne Palermo, a.k.a. Groovy Bean. I am joined with my brother from another spacey mother. It is Justin Deschamps. And joining us is 
Roger. We got Roger and KP. And KP, I'm going to have to learn how to say your blog correctly. Please do it. Koila Pele. WordPress.com. Say it again. Koila Pele. Love Kowilla it. Pele. And what does that mean? Koila actually means uh, the lightning or electricity. I love that. And it was a name that a kahuna gave to me oh, uh, shortly after I arrived in the islands. And uh, Pele is, of course, the goddess of creation and, yes. or, you know, fire and yeah. all that sort of thing. And Thank you. That's how we got together. Well, thank you. And folks, yes, everybody just exited the building. We had a fan freaking tastical dinner. OM to the Capitol. Gee hee. Yeah. And it 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 has been that we get the crickets chirping. We've had deer visiting us. The train coming the by. The train, the train coming by. by. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Roger, you would like to say some words. I think that um, one of the most amazing things about us kind of coming together in the FDN group this weekend is that all of us, um, you know, we've met each other through the internet and we've never seen each other face to face. And Justin and, and Yvonne and, and Renee, you know, they flew into to Portland. They met us or met me and, and we took the day to drive down here together. And, and one of the things that um, was really amazing is... You know, people that are a part of the truth movement, a lot of the times we live a duality in life, you know, where we go to work, we go to school, we have children, we have jobs, we have businesses, and there's a part of our life that we can't necessarily share with most of the people in our lives sometimes. And the opportunity that presented itself here and the drive down here and also this weekend and at conferences like this is that people can talk openly. People can express the, the, the deepest aspects of themselves within that truth exploration. And they're with kin. They're with um, mm -hmm. they're with their friends. They're with people that can understand and relate. And the type of conversation that propagates, and the type of you know dialogue, heart centered dialogue that comes out of connections like this, you walk away feeling reinvigorated. You walk away feeling validated. You don't feel crazy. You know you you are honoring that that kind of true higher connection to yourself. And so mm -hmm. the experience here this weekend, um, you know, I'm expecting to be you know exponential on that whole energy. Yes. You know, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I've this is not my first powwow with meeting people, but the energy mm. that you bring when you come and you actually get to meet people that you feel like you can be yourself with is amazing. And you walk away, I know I walk away feeling it, that vibe for, you know, days, weeks, even months mm. potentially. So I know that's a really good experience to have. So, Yes. And I will, I will say the energy has just been Woo! Fantabulous in every yes. which way. It's officially a maze balls. Can I just say it is a maze balls energy? It is. It Amaze really balls. is. One hundred percent a maze balls. <laughs> so, what did you guys think about some of the, you know, the panel questions and answers that that came back? You know, especially when addressing, you know, Justin's question about Corey's recent update. You know, the second yes. update about the the percentage of ascension and things like that. That's this is something obviously that people are concerned about. Oh, it's a bit. I got, mm -hmm. um, I think at least five or six emails of people who are very concerned mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, we weren't going to have a big ascension or that, um, that we're going to have cataclysms or things like this. And I really liked, uh, Corey's answer, which mm -hmm. is basically that we are, we're players in this process. And I think a lot of us or a lot of people may conceptualize what's happening as, as a voyeuristic thing where we're watching things happen and we're not actually players in the game. Mm -hmm. But in reality, we are players. So yes, we're watching things unfold, but at the same time, we're contributing and we get to play our part and put our energy into making this thing more than what it, it is right now. So I was very, impa I, I was very impacted when Corey said that even he is not one of them. When he's not when amongst he, the... he is not amongst the, the one out of 20. 300 or 2,500 yeah, total 300,000, I think. Yeah. And, said. and I, and, and holy wake up calls. Right. I mean, that, that's just cause here somebody that's having these interactions, but yet it doesn't make sense. It, it, it caught me and I was just, Whoa, what? Okay. We all really need <laughs> to look within and be this change. And this is now it's right now. Woo. Definitely. Right. 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 I would agree with that too in the way that, you know, also when you look at America, 
I would guess that the least percentage of people that are going to ascend are here. When you go and mm-hmm. like, I travel a lot throughout the world and people live simply and they live humbly and they live in peace. And this, this space, this energy that they hold, this um, unconditional love that they hold for family and a relationship to nature and mm-hmm. interaction with nature, mm-hmm. a connection to the natural world to me is what identifies somebody that is ready for that, you know, to yeah. ready to kind of merge into that next density because they're living that experience in a relationship with the natural world. We here in America have the toughest jobs period to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Every single day we're inundated through television. Every single day we're inundated through advertising and all different types of social and religious structures that are separating us from our higher selves. And so the opportunity, I think, for us as a wake up call for Americans, Westerners, Mm. modern people, you Mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. first world people is to get back to the roots, get back to connecting to source, get back to connecting to nature, Mm -hmm. get back to living from a humble state of appreciation within your existence here and a place of unconditional love and contribution to the people around you. Right, right. How do you feel, KP, KP, about that? I feel you're all right on. Uh, (laughs) One of the things that, you know, they're you're talking about when he was talking about, you know, we're all part of the process. Mm -hmm. And that's, I know a lot of so-called weird people, you know, some of whom were here tonight, (laughs) but I know some from, you know, Mm -hmm. my past work. And of course myself, you know, I, I'm here. I'm not, I didn't come here for the conference. I didn't actually come here for this. I mean, Mm -hmm. that -hmm. wasn't my original intention. This just sort of, happened yeah same here. and i get this email and said well would you like to come and i did want to meet Corey, mm-hmm. but another one thing Corey said was that you know these communications with uh, telepathic communications with his the higher beings mm-hmm. they're quick they're not they're not long right. lasting right and i think mean, anyone who has done and i'm not saying everybody feels this way but i can tell you when that happens to me I don't try and figure out who it's from. Now that maybe mm. some people need to have that information, mm-hmm. but I get the information and it's like, we go, right. That's right. it. Mm. Go. And, you know, we just hop in the plane, you know, mm-hmm. do the orbit thing or whatever and get the rental car and do our thing, go mm-hmm. through, mm-hmm. you know, going from 60 degrees to, 105 degrees. Now, I'm not complaining about that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Driving all the way up and getting an hour and a half worth of sleep. And I guess Corey only got three hours in the last couple of days. We got like barely it's any like, sleep. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> we're we are, we are all officially just a smidge cuckoo ca yeah. It's official. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> yes, yes. See, we're all together in the same, in the same uh, arena. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But it's very, to me, it's... Again, and I know Corey has mentioned this quite a bit, that it's it's an inner work. Mm-hmm. It's an inner work. It's, it's allowing what's within, the messages that are from within, which I consider communications from mm. kind of higher up. Yeah. I can say it's my higher self. You know, we're all connected. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so... You know, and something that you said, KP, as far as like being in the moment, you mm-hmm. listen for those pings. You listen for those things that say, am I going now? Am I not going now? Who, you know, who knows? You don't necessarily have to plan. It's about being able to be open to that kind of natural river of life. I think a lot of people get caught up into the planning and their, their scheduling mm-hmm. and all those things. And yes, you have responsibilities. And yes, I understand what it means to be a parent and, and all of those things. But the opportunity when inspiration arises is, is that place where your higher self, I believe is giving you a tap on the shoulder, you know, Mm. letting you know, like follow this for a second. And I totally, I live spontaneously too, you know, and I love that. I love living spontaneously. It's a much more, Mm -hmm. um, alive feeling. You feel much more connected to your intuition and your surroundings because you look for signs, you look for totems, you look for things that, you know, are leading you down certain ways and you can feel that. I hear, Hey, 
I have to tell you something, folks. You want to tell the story about our little box with the numbers yeah. on it? Yeah, and yeah. we can post a photo, too. We, we yeah. posted a we photo, did, yeah. folks, at the Facebook group. And uh, Roger and I were going to pick up the microphone equipment when I uh, landed in Portland. We had to go get the stuff. And uh, we go in to get the equipment. And they go, <laughs> oh, here's your box. And look at the, the card on the box. And no joke. There's an 11, 11 right on the box. Out and of all the boxes <laughs> with the numbers, totally. that that was our box for the show tonight. Right. So if yeah. that and right there, that thing. It's right? confirmation, and yeah. I wasn't even paying attention. And that's a perfect example of that. You know, I was so wrapped up into the mental things of I got to get the right mics. I, you know, I got to make sure that you know right. you guys are supported and happy. And I didn't. You know, Yvonne. You're nudging me, you know, yeah. take a look. And to me, I just no, saw an like, 11. No, really I'm like, look. oh, wow, that's, that's no, cool. Look. And then later you're like, dude, <laughs> look at this. And I was like, right. oh my gosh, you right. know, and right. it is, it's one of those beautiful validations and right. they happen, you know, weekly for me. You know? I'm going to interrupt you right there. Yeah. And I want to say, hey, to those in the chat, Sophie just came in with a question. Mm -hmm. And Sophie, thank you for this question. And folks that are there, Larry, I see you, Doug, Desiree, Catalina, Fran, and all of you listening in there. Hey, thank you for the support tonight because, yes, man, definitely. what it took to put this together, amaze balls, and thank you, universe. Yes. Sophie is saying, can you all give more detail by what you mean by inner work? And just that little bit about being some, some inner work here is about being in the present, in the now, and when you look really We'll just take take that breath right. and no, really look and observe the situation. That's just a little smidge of inner work. But Roger, Justin, what do you yeah, think well, about? Yeah, well, I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a a special day for me mm -hmm. for a lot mm -hmm. of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, one is because a year ago today, Julian, my partner, he actually passed away, and. For everybody who's any lost anybody, that's a serious thing when you lose somebody. And I think what my experience has taught me is that the inner work starts with you just changing how you look at the world. And so let me go into that a little bit. You know, we're taught that death is this kind of horrible thing, and the only way to interpret it is for it to be a negative kind of a situation. And when I lost Julian, I, I went through that process because I, I, this is the training that I experienced in life. But in the background of all of that, there was this other voice that was telling me, you know, do you really, is that really what you believe? Is that really your inner journey? Mm -hmm. Is that really your, your highest truth? And it wasn't. And over the basically a year's time, I let go of that belief that was telling me I needed to feel bad. I needed to, um, feel guilty about something. Like I remember when I started to have an appreciation for what he had given me by even going, by passing away, by actually transitioning into spirit. And, and I started to feel joy for that. And a part of me was saying, well, you know, you can't feel joy. You're supposed to feel sad. You're not supposed to feel happy. And I needed to let go of that process, let go of that thought that was telling me, you know, you needed to feel bad about this experience. So when we ask what is the inner work, for me that the way I answer that question is to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, when we we're living life, especially in the modern world where this you're constantly like you're earning a living, you have to keep up with appearances. You know, now we got smartphones, so you've got you have to like keep up with all of this stuff, mm -hmm. and it's just nonstop things happening all the time, and you get lost in the process. And before you know it, you're just running on autopilot. And you're just kind of watching your life unfold around you. So when I think about doing the inner work, I think about investing myself fully in the moment. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to put my 100% of myself in that. And literally nothing else exists except mm -hmm. what I'm doing right now. Um, I play a, a little guitar. I've been playing guitar for about, I don't know, like 15 years at this point. And I'm not a professional by any means. But I, 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 for me, this experience of playing an instrument is really important because it's an, an excellent analogy for doing the inner work. And the inner work is you have to be invested. You have to be um, deliberate. That's a phrase I use a lot. So if you're going to do something, if, gonna, if I'm going to play, try to play a song, I can't half-ass it or it's going to come out in the work. It's not going to sound like 
I've tried to put put 100% of my energy into it. But when you pour 100% of what you are into something, mm -hmm. then the result you get is much more yes. you know, full. And yes. so that for me, when we talk about doing inner work, it's about investing yourself into the experience, asking yourself why you're doing the things that you're doing, and being willing to let go of past choices and beliefs and even relationships with people that aren't serving you anymore mm -hmm. because it's all about growth. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question that was posed from one of the audience members, KP, while you were grabbing mm -hmm. your jacket out there. It's yeah. cold here it, in it, Shasta. Folks, it, it is. It, we were, we, it was, Being what, 90, wasn't it? 85, it, it 90 was, degrees. It was hot. And, and then we it all just went was... inside, came back out in 10, 10 yeah. 15 degrees Definitely. later. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. One of the audience um, that are listening right now typed in a question, and their, their question was about the inner work. Can, can we give some more ex explanation of what doing that inner work means, you know, to us? Oh, boy. Um, a lot of times that, you know, there's things that I can tell you today was a whole day of inner work mm. for me. Um, but we get these, sometimes I really feel they're like, like certain sticky parts of ourselves that it's time to let go mm -hmm. and we'll get this. In other words, that point will get will stick to something mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll view it as, you know, Oh, Holy crap. Mm -hmm. You know, no, mm -hmm. that's, that's not a great thing. But I, the word came to me today about, you know, uh, oppositional moments, mm -hmm. oppositional points, mm -hmm. you know, when we're ready to release something, a lot of times it'll come up as an opposition or something that doesn't look, you know, like it's just, that's not us. I don't like this. Right. My car wasn't working right today. I don't have cruise control. 